good to see everybody. I can't remember. I know this is our last meeting of the year, but I feel like we haven't we haven't had too many meetings this year for the venue uh, best practice. So I think this is personally for me an exciting one. Can't wait to um, hear what these guys have to say. So everyone knows me, so I don't have to introduce myself, but I'm just going to go kind of according to my screen. Everyone can say hi who they are and then we will get started. Uh, John, you are first on the screen. Hello, my name is John Fideski, and I am the Chief Operating Officer of We Reuse, and I look forward to having a conversation with you all today. Great. Kelly? Hi, I'm Kelly Urban, and I'm the CEO of We Reuse, and I also look forward to hearing your thoughts on um, what John has to share with you. Great. Fred? Hi, I'm Fred Reddick, Director of Facilities at Ford Field on Detroit Lions. Happy to be here. Nice seeing everybody. One of our biggest supporters since the beginning. Al. Good afternoon, Al Vasquez with Huntington Place Engineering Department. Another big supporter and board member, Caitlin. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Caitlin. I'm the operations manager for Elite Sports and Entertainment. So out of mainly out of Little Caesars Arena. Yep, a little uh, Brianna. Hey everyone, um, I'm Brianna. You can just call me B. Uh, I'm the manager of sustainability over at Climate Pledge Arena and the Seattle Kraken. I'm excited to talk to you all today about the building and about sustainability. Great. Jordan. Hi, I'm with uh, We Reuse. I'm just here to be John's secretary. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, there's not too much new. I mean, I could give you a short recap on Detroit 2030, but that's usually if there's more people on the call. But you know, we're we're rocking and rolling. We have 52 million square feet in our program in Detroit. That's almost 500 buildings to help them reduce energy and water consumption and transportation emissions. Uh, we are the fourth largest now in um, the country. Um, behind three other really huge ones like Seattle, Pittsburgh, and Cleveland. Uh, we have three districts in Michigan, in case you don't know, Grand Rapids, Ann Arbor, and Detroit. And um, we just had the summit here in October. It was a huge success. We had all the districts here. And um, anyways, if you ever come to Detroit, these are some of the people, facilities that are in our program. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna have John go first, if you wanna try to pull up your screen. And um, this is very informal. John's just gonna, let me let me preface John talking first though, I, um, I should say. So I learned about reuse probably, I don't know, maybe a year ago, John. And um, I was really excited about it. At first I was like, oh, but your products are made out of plastics. And in my head, I'm trying not to use plastics. But when you learn about the reuse program and, and all of that, it really makes sense, right? Instead of trying to recycle everything. Um, so this is a new company, but um, the conversation today, uh, if you want to hit your PowerPoint, PowerPoint down there, John, there you go. Uh, the conversation today is kind of to open the door and um, just kind of have an open conversation after John's done about any thoughts and questions that you might have. Um, so it's going to be a Q&A after he's done. So I will let you uh, take it from here. Okay, thank you, Connie. Um, we reuse is very new on paper, but we've been in conversations amongst ourselves for a few years. Uh, we are, I'm gonna give you a little background on myself and then I'll tell you more about the company. We, I have been in the transportation business for about 35 years and have been a person that does not like waste. So in my own transportation business, I found ways to reduce my, I will go carbon footprint. Um, and then throughout the years, over the years, I discovered this uh, reuse products for, you know, then use like this. And um, so about six or seven years ago, I cut out every possible single use product that I could in my in my company. We got rid of uh, using boxes to ship our material. We got rid of 
uh, we, we limited the amount of um, tape we were using, all, everything, anything to reduce the, the footprint. And then um, about three years ago, I realized that uh, we could, oh boy, let's see. About three years ago, I decided to do something about, you know, do a bigger, have a bigger impact on the, the reuse. So um, in doing my research, I realized that arenas and transportation companies and just about every area could be, we can um, do a better job with the uh, get using single, get rid of single use. Our solutions for arenas are reusable pizza boxes, reusable cups, reusable containers and collections. In this, we, we did not start out with pizza boxes. We were just doing some research on transportation. And then, you know, we came across this, that this, uh, you know, this is a product that definitely gets, doesn't get composted that often in most places can't even be recycled. Yeah. Benefits for the reuse for the, for the arenas. Oh, sorry, we got, it's, Waste is virtually eliminated with this reuse. Upfront costs are can be offset of average lifetime use of the product. Life cycle will vary by the product, but um, we our our data shows that we have you can get about three hundred uses out of our our products, whether it's a cup, it's a container, or a pizza box. Here's some success stories that are using reusable products right now in the world, in uh, in the arenas, Emirates Stadium in London, and the univer in uh, university cities and counties are very big, uh, very big into going to this. The universities throughout the United States are not using it in their arenas so much, but they are using it in their meal halls and so forth. A little bit more about us. We launched the pizza box in 2022, as I said. Um, but we have been, as I stated earlier, we've been exploring reusable packaging systems for shipping in anywhere we, where we can eliminate single use. Uh, our pizza box has been overwhelmingly successful We um, with the people that currently use it. And... Uh, let's see. Yep, everything made in the United States, which that also helps on the carbon footprint. Let's see what else. And then, yeah, just a little video for you. No sound. And that's about. Oops, that's it. And that's about all I have. I look forward to hearing your feedback. Sorry it didn't flow as well as I had hoped, but um, I think you get the gist of it. Yeah, right, so let's yeah. just open up the conversation. I was just curious, um, our, our, our three arenas here, well, venue and arena, arenas. Um, have you guys been using any re products, reuse products at all or thought about it? Um, I know we've thought about it. I'm curious. So what are the pizza boxes made of that you have? Right. We, we can right now they're made in, made with corrugated plastic that it's the so it would look just like your current pizza box. Yeah, we um, we went we went that route because it was less expensive and it's just as durable. It's polypropylene. So, uh, you know, there's no other additives to it. Okay, so we are researching right now um, on the possibility of closing the flutes because there were some concerns about uh, water, grease, food building up down in the flute itself. Even though we have not run into that ourselves, just some people, it was uh, it, it was one of the 
it was a concern of a city that we were talking to. So you run that through regular dish machine then? You you can just you just hand wash it. Hand wash it, okay. Yeah, hand wash. You can run it through a industrial washing system if you have one in the arena. Like if Ford Field has one, then you could just run it right through that and just let it dry and be ready to go the next day. Okay. One and other thing I'll add is they are collapsible, so they're they're collapsible and can be put together, so easy storage. Okay. It just it, looks. I don't know if you could see it, but it looks like yeah. this. Okay. So with the ones that like uh, the stadium you have in London, are they using those? No, this, those were not our clients. They were just uh, people that are currently doing that operation. Okay. They're just used right now. London is just using cup. Both those facilities I mentioned in Europe are just using cups. Okay. They have not been, we have not introduced that to them, the bo the pizza box. Um, there's, vir there's virtually no sports arenas using reusable containers. Um, it is happening in concert venues and one of our partners that if they get three or four venues in a specific city, they'll um, open their own um, lawn, for lack of a better term, uh, I guess dishwashing facility. I was going to say laundromat, but right. um, you, you understand the principle. And they'll collect every morning, wash them, deliver them back every afternoon for your next event. And I mean, the, the venues that are using these, have you found out that the, the fans themselves are on board with this or are they throwing a lot of these out anyways? Now, depending on what route you take, whether you, you buy the cups from us or we do it on, we'll educate your, your employees basically and try to get them to pay attention to people taking them. But yes, we do expect there be some some waste, some loss. Okay. But for the most part, once the fans are educated, then, you know, they start putting them back. But I mean, people are gonna take, regardless of, in, in most environments, somebody's gonna want a souvenir. Oh um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's, but we would educate, you know, we would put posters and every, like I said, we'd have meetings with your staff to, try to um, educate, not try to, we would have meetings with your staff to educate them to make sure that they're looking for, you know, maybe not stop them, but say, hey, next time, you know, could you just drop that in the bin or whatever? Right. And we would, so we, we put up you, bins. Um, if you get, if you uh, drink out of one of those reusable cups and you get beer, do you walk back up and give them the same cup for your next beer? You can, that's, that's going to be depending on the facility. So, and it's also going to depend on which program we, we give to the facility, because um, again, if, if you, if you, we, we do the lease program, you want to do it one way. If you do where you purchase it outright, you know, you guys can do however way you want. So so one of our one of our partners initially started with their cups and very specific for um, performing artists. In fact, some artists now insist on that, and they found that if when they logoed it to the artist, everybody kept it as a souvenir cup. Sure. And so <laughs> they started discouraging that process because they were number one using product and kind of number two defeating the purpose. So not to say you want to make your pro or our product as generic as possible, but you might want not want to make it a collector's item. So I just, again, that's down the road, but it's just food for thought. Or you could um, charge more for the logo one, right? Cause you're saying uh, that the venue themselves would lose money if they took the cup out. Um, it's still a good idea though, because then they take it home and they still don't throw it in the trash. But um, I was at a, I'm trying to think of what it was. It was a theater and we, um, they had logo cups just like that. And we brought them home. They were kind of heavy plastic. They cost too much money, but you got the logo. <laughs> Same idea though. Yeah. 
Okay. Sorry. So, John, John, can you talk a little bit about your uh, ship, your idea of uh, shipping um, crates or whatever those are called? Well, and on all of your, because of uh, my my background in transportation, I do have ideas on how arena i'd have to see i have not been in the bowels of any of your arenas but um the i would believe that there's areas in the, within the arena where we could improve uh reduce you um waste down there because weight whether it's with the pallets and i know some people up use the pallets and do and i think b actually will talked about that when her and i were on the phone the other day but there are other pallets that you can use, especially if the lions are going on the road and then they're going to go to, you know, they're going to go bust their equipment down to Chicago. I don't know how you do it, but mm -hmm. there's, instead of just using boxes, you use that just get there. And then the people in the soldier field throw the boxes away. We have contain, we can make any size container you want that, you could just reuse over and over again. You just, it'll collapse completely and you just set it in the back or, you know, where all the rest of the equipment stuff is and fill it back up when it's time to go again. And they, you know, I, um, for instance, and I, I haven't figured this one out yet, but for B, I noticed that in, in Climate Pledge, they walk around with a plastic bag. I don't know, and I'm not trying to call you out, B, it's just an example of what, um, I mean, you might be using that bag a hundred times. I don't know, but is there a way to convert that bag into something that can be recycled or can we make you something? Can we build you a product that you can maybe push through the aisles to where, and then when it gets down to where all your stuff's sorted, you know, it just gets dumped out and set aside as opposed to, you know, then you just use it over and over and over again. So we could go on. I mean, you could go into the bathroom if you're using paper towels, maybe get rid of paper towels. I'm not trying to give you all my secrets, but, you know, go to cloth towels or something else that's more for reuse. And on the, the shipping containers, um, you got to think these are the size of, you know, um, think of a, the, the, the size of a pallet but up, you know, several feet and they are durable beyond uh, anything you can believe. And you see these gator boxes where they'll break down and companies will try to reuse them and maybe a half a dozen uses they'll break down. These shipping containers will last hundreds of uses. I have a quick question. Um, so we have had reuse on our radar for about a year now since we've been open. And um, a big question that we have had is, okay, what about demand? So if we have eight events in a row with about 15,000 people coming in every single day, can, I guess, reuse keep up with that demand for surge facilities like arenas and stadiums? Yes, and then what we, so depending on your cleaning capabilities, if you said you had three events in a row, we would probably make sure you have, and it's 15,000, we'd make sure you had 45,000 cups on hand, right? And because after every, again, depending on which system we set up for you, if you're going to go with where we're cleaning your, your product, which we will offer, we'll go into your, um, your city and we'll try to go into the economic development area or into an economic and develop area and build a whole high-end cleaning facility. Uh, and then, you know, we go and pick it all up. If you are cleaning on site, then obviously we would make sure you're, you're having 45 to 60,000 cups on hand. Awesome. And, Thank you. Yeah. And again, we will, and the beauty of us is we're going to take every single cup or pizza box that you use that gets this, that gets um, once it's in the end of its life cycle, we're going to take it back, recycle it, and make it right back into that same product again. Okay, so it's not going to end up. And yes, we're going to have damage, we're going to have theft, and we're going to have all that, but that's all built into to the costing. 
have you guys considered also um, reporting attached to that? Like, um, so if Climate Pledge uses 30,000 reusables in a week, is there any type of report that you all roll out with your service that says, oh, wow, look how much you've saved by avoiding 10,000, let's just say single use plastic plates? Yes, we do have data and it'll be on your invoice that will set again, depending on how we go, we have different billing systems, but yes, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll be able to do that. Now, if you buy the cups outright, it's going to be more on your own, but we will be able to provide you with some data. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do, do you, I think you have statistics or can measure the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions um, too at, at some point, correct? Um, yes. Yes. So you could report on that. Mm -hmm. B, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking, but. A little uh, bit of both, yep. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the um, cups can be scanned in one manner or another. And what Either as they're, as they're being dropped into the recycling or as they're washed. And what about um, like cost savings or anything like that? Can you talk a little bit about that? Again, it depends. Oh, sorry. Again, it depends on what avenue you take. If you are what we call, say, you're using the leasing program, then that's where we're built. We're we're doing our own cleaning. And um, that cost is, there is not much of a cost savings from the cups because we're going to charge you roughly what you're paying for a current one use cup every time you use that cup. If you buy the cup outright, um, there'd be a significant cost savings because now you own the cup and you're going to, I can't tell you the exact number, but after seven uses or 10 uses, you now have broken even. So everything else after that is a cost savings. But I'm assuming we're having this conversation I, because money isn't the main factor here for you, but it is. it always comes into play. You know, so that's why we offer you both options to where you want to just lease it or you want to buy the product outright. And then everything's handled a little bit differently. One of our partners has experimented <clears throat> with a very small sustainability fee on each transaction to help pay for the, the, the uh, reasonable product. And they've met with no pushback whatsoever, um, not to <laughs> ruffle any feathers, but I think people are so used to paying a large dollar amount for their beverage at a, an arena that an extra two pennies on the transaction doesn't, draw their attention um, and we can talk to you about what uh you know the uh, uh roi how many uses to to recoup your recoup your cost and things like that so um i uh, if i would meet i think you know in the, the the current climate i think everybody's gonna be up for yeah i'll pay a couple pennies to help you know right. reduce carbon footprint so, um, so your leasing program, does that include the cleaning then? Yes. Okay. Yes. Does Ford Field have a industrial cleaning uh, washing system? Oh yeah, we have, we have like four of them. Okay. All right. I figured you did because of all the people you had coming and going. Yeah, we, yes, we, we will. Like a, we have sixty thousand people here every game. Right. Well, I figured you did, but you know, <laughs> just wanted to make okay. sure. So you could just examine both the cost of both of those programs and see, yeah. Well, we but also- if you wash it yourself, you've got your labor doing it too. So it's something to think about. Right. Because yeah, if you and, don't- and this, and, Right, we will take it. We'll, we, we try to, we like the aspect of us washing it ourselves. One, we can maintain how the, make the wear and tear on the cups. We have somebody inspecting them. We also are bringing new jobs into the, into the area. And as I said earlier, we try to go into the, the economically, you know, the places where they're trying to develop economically. And, and I believe if I think Little Caesars was built 
in an area like that, correct? Were they? Well, um, yes and no. Okay. All right. <laughs> I can't yeah, I mean, maybe people comment, but yeah. All, all the sports teams are downtown within a, a half a mile of each other. Oh, Fort, I didn't yeah. even know Fort Field was down there. Okay. So yeah. there you go. Yeah. So they're all, yeah, downtown or midtown okay. area. Um, but there's a lot of underserved communities, obviously, in Detroit, but those are mostly in the more neighborhoods. Yeah. Well, so I it's... guess my Go question would be you're going to build a or create a facility to wash them. Do you then pick them up like in a truck or something like that? Yes, they'll get, you'll, we'll have bins throughout the stadium. We'll come through and pick them up and then we'll, take them and wash them, we scan them. That's how we know how many, we have an RFID on each cup. So we, that's how we know how many cups you use and that's how we know how to bill you. And our, our, our invoice should match up pretty close to your beverage sales, right? Cause we're, if we're, you know, so it should be, I'm not gonna say it's gonna be a hundred percent but it should be very accurate. Yeah. If you know you sold a hundred beers, we should have used a hundred, you know, we should have gotten close to a hundred cups back. And again, we're never going to be at a hundred percent. So you could potentially try this out and, um, you know, the cost would be pretty much the same maybe of what you're already doing. But so even if you didn't have a return on investment, which you may, but now you've got all your bragging rights and you're reducing your carbon footprint and, and all of that. So Kind of and you're also going to save on your the composting and the stuff that's going to end up in the landfill okay. and the, the and the labor for to do all of that. So there's other savings uh, okay. in there. You know, compo you we, we, composting is great, but we we think this is a better alternative for it. <clears throat> okay, great. Any other questions? I got one for John. John, uh, do they require special racks? Meaning we've got the industrial dishwashers here uh, to put the cups in. Do you have special racks for those or it's just regular glass racks? We have, our, we have all our own, but yes, they're basically regular glass racks. Okay. And how many, it. oh, you're good. And how many re reuses roughly did you think you could get out of a cup? 300. Oh, okay. There is now again, we're going to have spoilage, and but for the most part, it's about 300 uses. And then after the, the that end of life, it would it could an option would be to have them recycled by you, or are they recyclable by municipalities around here? Is it what is it a certain kind of plastic where it's easy for me to just have someone pick it up around here? Yes, you absolutely you can. Yes, we just want to make sure that it's getting it's getting recycled. We would prefer that we take it back, but we don't have to have it. Okay. And last, I think I heard that we could brand these things. We could put our logo or something like that on these cups. Yes, depending on the color of the cup will depend will determine you know how many colors you can put on the cup. Okay. Thank you. So if you have a logo one, um can people bring the cup back with them to their next game? That or, in, in Arizona, you can do that. Every You'd have to check with your local uh, health department to see what their concern is. I would recommend they not do it because, mm -hmm. well, first of all, we can't track it. <laughs> but, you, you know, it's uh, that's that would be a venue by venue and health department issue question. Okay. Got it. Great. Any other questions or if we're just on time, that's perfect. Thank you, John, Jordan. Um, thanks for your input and uh, awesome. I'm sure these guys will reach out to us if you guys wanna talk further and get some sort of analysis done and talk. This is really just a good starting point for us. We've not covered this topic at all in any, in, you know, reuse is not something we've talked about, you know, our groups been together for five years and it's really exciting to start talking about reuse. And I'm sorry, Connie, cup. one more for John. Uh -huh. Just does it, putting a brand on that cup, does it change the durability at all? Is it stronger not putting colors or things on it or is it the same? 
same. It doesn't impact the 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 makeup of the cup. Very good. Thank you. And and that's not going to come off. That logo is going to stay there through the use of, for the most part, it should stay there through the life of the cup. All right. Well, thanks. I'm sure if you guys have other other questions, we can follow up again. You can meet separately. So just let us know. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate right. you putting this together, Connie. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. Can I sit on and listen to B? Of course. Okay. <laughs> I'm sticking around. Oh, here comes somebody else. He needs him to. So B, uh, are you able to share your screen? Let's see here. I sure am. Okay, and we are recording this, so we are super excited to hear what you guys are doing at your arena. Um, this um, recording is also going to be available if anybody you want to share it with anybody at your facility. So, um, and be on our YouTube channel. Awesome. Well, thank you again for having me. Again, Brianna, call me B, Manager of Sustainability for the Kraken and Climate Pledge Arena. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the building why we're named Climate Pledge Arena, what does that mean? What does it mean to be a signatory of Amazon's Climate Pledge? I'm gonna talk a little bit about our zero carbon certification and what that entails. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the cool sustainability features we have on site, including that 44 million pound steel roof that we reused during reconstruction, um, our rain to rink system, as well as the living wall. And then I'll kind of talk through a couple of uh, carbon reduction strategies that we've implemented here on site. So I'll dive right in. And again, if you all have any questions as I'm going through, super casual, feel free to interrupt me. Happy to answer any and all questions as we go through. Um, so originally, the arena was called the Coliseum um, in 1962. It was built alongside the monorail and the Space Needle during that World's Fair. Um, it's gone through quite a few name changes. So from 1962 called the Coliseum to Key Arena, and then most notably Key Arena to Climate Pledge Arena. Um, groundbreaking started in December of 2018. Um, you know, before the naming rights of the arena were decided, it was already decided that they were gonna reuse that 44 million pound steel roof. Um, so you can kind of see here during the construction process that the roof was literally held up by metal beams for about two years. So construction started in 2018, construction uh, went through the pandemic, and then we opened our doors October of 2021. Um, but mid-construction, we had conversations with Amazon on what the naming of the building was going to be. Amazon ended up buying the naming rights of the building, and instead of calling it the Amazon Arena, they wanted to make it more intentional and call it the Climate Pledge Arena after their um, Climate Pledge, which I'll dive into a little bit later. Here's just a look into our bowl post-construction. So we were built to be NHL and NBA, uh, about 18-1 for NBA and about 17-1 for hockey and concerts. Um, we're set to be the first venue in the world to have a net zero carbon certification, which I'll touch on a little bit later as well. Um, so the Climate Pledge. So we don't, we're not Amazon Arena, we're at the Climate Pledge Arena. What does that mean? It means that Amazon decided that they wanted to utilize the arena as kind of a beacon for sustainability and a beacon for their initiative, um, the Climate Pledge, which calls on large corporations like arenas, like corporations like Pepsi, Alaska Airlines, you name it, to go net zero by 2040, 10 years ahead of the Paris Agreement. Um, us at Climate Pledge, we are offsetting all of our carbon every year, so we're more than meeting that 2040 goal. Um, there are about 376 other companies that are also a part of the Climate Pledge right now. Um, a couple of those are our corporate partners. So Pepsi, um, Alaska Airlines, Verizon, um, just a few to name. So we're a part of the Climate Pledge. Our name is Climate Pledge. What does it mean? So by acquiring the naming rights, the Climate Pledge, we had to follow a couple of stipulations. One being that we were going to be a net zero carbon arena and that we weren't going to have any fossil fuels on site. And we were going to implement carbon reduction strategies in all of our operations. So 
to commit to this um, to commit to this pledge, we have to regularly report all of our utilities and all of our carbon. So a large portion of my job is checking those energy, water, and waste bills, tracking them every single month, and then going through all of our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions and regularly reporting those to our team at Amazon. Um, so once I've gathered all of that data, I'm regularly regularly reporting. Then I'm looking at the data and I'm thinking, hmm, transportation looks like a heavy hitter in terms of carbon. What can we do in terms of our operations to eliminate carbon from the get-go? And then once that year has passed and I've finished that year's carbon accounting, what is left over, what cannot be reduced, um, we credibly offset. So let's just call it 10,000 metric tons that we have generated or emitted over one year span. That 10,000 metric tons of carbon now needs to be offset. So we are investing in companies that are taking just as much carbon out of the atmosphere as we are emitting every single year. On top of the naming rights agreement, on top of being a signatory of the Climate Pledge, um, we committed to having the first zero carbon certification of any venue in the world. It's the most stringent certification out there in terms of carbon accounting. Um, and to even be able to participate in this certification, there were three major stipulations. One being the, there could be no fossil fuel usage on site, um, no natural gas, no fossil fuels related to fleet vehicles. So what's kind of crazy is during that construction process, so about 2019, midway through, the naming rights were acquired. Well, once the naming rights were acquired and these stipulations were presented, we knew that we had to build the, the building a little bit differently. So from the get-go, natural gas lines were actually up to the point where they were hooked up to our building. So even if you looked right now on a map, you would see those natural gas lines leading right up to our building, but they are not connected to anything. So as we were about to pour that concrete, we were like, hold up, we got to electrify the whole building. Um, so the building is all electric, the only all electric arena in the world, which is pretty wild. Um, our Zambonis are electric, our forklifts are electric, any fleet vehicle you'd find on site, completely electric. So that was the first stipulation. The second was that we had to run off of 100% renewable energy. Um, so currently we're buying RECs to cover that renewable energy that we use every single year, but we don't want to lean on RECs forever, right? So we are actually signing a PPA with Seattle City Light for them to build us a solar and wind farm that we will only tap into moving forward once that solar and wind farm is built. So buying RECs currently will we'll be running off of 100% renewable energy by 2024. Um, another stipulation was that we had to have renewable energy on site. Um, so I'll show you in a couple of pictures um, after this slide, a picture of our solar panels um, on our garage and on our Alaskan Airlines atrium. They only account for about 1% of the energy consumed on site, but was a requirement of that um, zero carbon certification. Um, we're also set to achieve that certification by June of next year. So coming up real fast. Um, here's just a glimpse of Climate Pledge Arena and a really good view of the solar panels on our Alaskan Airlines atrium. Um, people always ask me, B, you guys have a really large roof. Why aren't there solar panels all over that roof? Um, it's a historic landmark. So we were unable to place solar panels um, that would impact the integrity of the roof. So we had to place them on our Alaskan Airlines atrium, which is the only part of the arena that extends beyond the roof and the newest part of the arena. Um, we also have a solar panel array on our First Avenue garage just across the street. So on our Alaskan Airlines atrium, as well as across the street on our, on our First Avenue garage. And since I'm so obsessed with this roof, I guess gotta keep going on. So again, same roof from 1962, but what a lot of people don't know is that this roof was actually designed after an indigenous rain hat. So even in 1962, designed after an indigenous rain hat, and it's kind of ironic and iconic now that we're collecting rainwater off that very roof, um, which is, is just a super neat way to look at your region and figure out what natural resources you can utilize to mitigate um, the need for domestic water use. So we collect rainwater from the west side of our roof 
once it's collected, it goes down into a 15,000 gallon cistern that's buried right outside the plaza. So this picture kind of gives you a glimpse of what that cistern looks like, where it's buried and what that looked like during the construction process. So that rainwater goes down into that 15,000 gallon cistern, but then has to go make its way down to our ice room. So this is just a little bit of a glimpse on what that ice room looks like. Um, what you can't see is the Zambonis in the background. So the water will come in, go into these tanks, they'll get filtered and purified and then pumped with all of the NHL quality um, chemicals needed to then hook up to the Zambonis to make some of the greenest ice in the NHL. Um, one really cool fact is that last season we collected over 166,000 gallons of rainwater that we then used uh, throughout the whole hockey season. Um, something really neat that we did this year was that we had about 14,000 gallons of water left over from last season's rainy season that we didn't have to use in the summer because we didn't have ice in the building. So we actually filled up our entire ice rink with that 14,000 gallons of leftover water from last year. Um, into our ice rink for our first preseason game late in September, which is just really wild to me and, and super cool. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it means for us to be a zero waste facility, and then I'll dive into our uh, ban of single use plastic on site. So as a part of our naming rights agreement, we had a couple of goals. One of the goals was that we were going to operate as a zero waste facility. Um, and we have a really ambitious goal that 95% of all of our waste every single month have to be diverted away from a landfill. Um, super ambitious goal, especially for an arena. Um, I'm happy to say that since May of this year, we've met and exceeded that 95% diversion rate goal. Um, with the highest being in June, we had a 98%, which was um, a huge accomplishment for us and our team. And, um, you know, a big way of how we got there was we implemented on-site sorting in February of this year. So literally every single bag of trash that comes down from the concourse that hits our trash room, we call it our material recovery zone. Um, any, any bag that comes down there is ripped open by our housekeeping team to ensure that all of the materials are diverted to the correct stream. Um, we also weigh all of our landfill on site. Um, so anytime we're sorting, we're sorting out all of the recyclables, all of the compostables, whatever is left over is then weighed and sent to me at the end of the night where I can calculate our diversion rate each month. Um, we've made it really easy on ourselves, though, to operate as a zero waste facility. Um, we procure everything front of house to either be compostable or recyclable. So we're making it easier for us. We're making it easier for our fans to do the right thing by providing them options that don't belong in a landfill. Um, there's actually only four items on the concourse that need to be landfilled at all. And there are chip wrappers, candy wrappers, cliff bar wrappers, and wrappers found in the theater box candies, which we're already talking to Mars about finding a more compostable option or eliminating plastic from the from our from our procurement altogether. So on top of that zero waste goal or operating as a zero waste facility, we also uh, have a goal to ban single use plastic in the building by 2024, um, front of house. So we're already in conversations with Pepsi uh, on hopefully achieving that by the end of this year. Um, right now, we just can't find an aluminum option for those uh, Gatorade bottles. Um, so we're still talking with Pepsi and uh, we'll hopefully have that, have that rolled out, if not by the end of the year, by early, um, by early next year. So if you walk around our concourse right now, you'll be able to see that phase out happening in real time. Um, all of our Amazon marketplaces are going aluminum and we're kind of just using whatever plastic that we have left in our, in our, in our storage. Um, sustainable food options. So again, a part of the naming rights agreement, we had another food goal and a carbon reduction strategy built in. So we have a goal that 75% of all of our food ingredients um, are sourced within a 300 mile radius of the building. Why? It takes a lot of fossil fuels and greenhouse gas emissions to transport food and beverage to our building. Um, we wanted to procure as locally as possible to reduce the amount of fuel we need to, to transport these materials, as well as the carbon associated with that food and beverage transport. We also wanna support local because we see the benefit in that. 
Um, 60% of all of our wine and craft beer are procured within Washington and Oregon. So again, keeping it local, keeping it close, um, uh, really just cool carbon reduction strategy built within food. Um, a lot of people don't know this about me, but I have a past in waste. I was actually a professional trash talker for a couple of years and waste just seems to follow me everywhere. Um, I worked with the Orioles and Ravens and John Hopkins on building their waste diversion programs, um, as well as being a recycling coordinator for about a year in Maryland, um, about four or five years ago. So waste has always been really near and dear to me. Um, this is just a really fun story I like to share on how you can activate zero waste in your venue in a fun way that interacts with, you know, your staff internally as well as fans. So we had Billie Eilish come through our doors in March of this year. She had two back-to-back -back shows. And for all of you who might not know, Billie Eilish is a huge proponent, huge supporter of climate change and climate action. And she actually, as a, as a tour group, have um, sustainability stipulations that arenas have to follow in order for her to book at the venue. And we're seeing that become more and more popular with artists like Shawn Mendes, Coldplay, et cetera. So, since it was almost Earth Month, this was at the end of March of this year, we were like, what can we do to show off our Climate Pledge Arena? We have to do something for Billie Eilish to stand out. So I suggested, why don't we hold two zero waste shows for her and then see what we can do. And granted, at this time, we were not at 98%. Um, our diversion rate was nowhere where I'd loved it to be. So this was a really, really big jump for us um, because we had not hit 90 at this time. Um, so we went ahead and we, we said, we're going to do this. So, um, we achieved well over our goal. So to be considered a zero waste event, you have to have a 90% diversion rate or greater. So our goal was we have to hit 90 at least. Let's just hit 90, see what we can do. We've never done anything like this. Um, I'm really happy to say that after those two nights, we had a 96% diversion rate for those two shows, meaning that we achieved our goal um, and having those shows be completely zero waste. Um, really cool fact that just kind of opened our eyes. We generated about seven tons of waste over those two nights, um, meaning seven tons of compost, recycling, and landfill all together. But we only sent 522 pounds of waste to an actual landfill across those two days, um, which really opened my eyes because that means that the, the leftover six tons of waste we generated over those two shows were either composted or recycled. Um, so once we hit this 96% diversion uh, for those two shows, we realized, wow, this is kind of how we need to operate for all events if we ever wanna meet that ambitious 95% diversion rate goal that we have set in our naming rights agreement. Um, so again, really cool win for us. We were able to activate WM, who is our corporate partner, to help us out with this night. So you'll see a picture of me, our director of housekeeping, and then a member of um, WM's team that came out to support us. So a really cool way to work with your corporate partner, show off a little bit, um, and also kind of do something cool for the artist. Just one of my favorite stories. Um, most iconic hallway in the whole building, the living wall. Um, this was a way to emulate nature indoors, um, but also just a really cool activation uh, for Amazon's climate pledge in the building. Um, about 4,600 different, uh, 4,600 plants planted in this living wall, 26 different native plant species, all native to the PNW, which is really neat. So all of these plants would you'd be able to find if I went outside and hiked in the PNW forest, which is pretty cool. Um, what a lot of people don't know about the living wall is that we have hemlocks and they're kind of hard to see right here, um, but you'll see trees poking out of the living wall. We have about a half dozen and um, they're endangered hemlock species. So we, once they are mature enough, we are actually going to take them out once they're ready to be grown and plant them into actual forest here in the PNW that have needed them for decades. So just a really cool, fun initiative to use the plant wall to also do something for our local environment. Um, you can't really see, or maybe you can, the little gray potting pockets that are inside of the inside of the living wall. It's what the plants are actually planted into. 
Um, it's made out of a material that's made out of 100% uh, plastic water bottles. It's called Grotex. And apparently it's really good at evenly distributing water to plants to save on water. Um, the wall is also vertically watered. So that water comes down vertically, hits a drain down at the bottom, and then is recirculated back into the living wall to, to save on water there. Um, people always ask me, well, how much water does it use? Um, 4,000 gallons a month. So more than I had thought, but just a really fun stat to know. Um, the, the living wall also lives on the same part of the wall that uh, our rain to rink system collects water from. Just a, just a fun stat. Transportation. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest things that we knew that we were going to run into when the building opened was one, transportation around the city being super congested with the building opening up again, right? Um, two, we knew that it was going to be one of our heaviest carbon intensive KPIs that we were measuring. So for instance, at transportation is a scope three emission. So fans have to come to our building to get to the event. We know that we're always going to be operating. We're always going to be holding events. We're always going to be emitting carbon by people coming to the venue. Um, we know that we are going to be emitting carbon with performers coming to our venue. Um, so we're tracking that. So a large portion of my job is tracking those scope three emissions. So what does that mean? Um, it means that if Post Malone, who was in the building on Saturday, flew from San Jose, California to Seattle to New York, I'm not asking their production team, hey, how many private jets did y'all use? How many trucks? How many buses? How many cars? And where did y'all come from? That, and then I take that information and I'm able to actually plug that into our carbon dashboard, which I'll show you a snip of after this slide. Um, so I'm actually able to attribute carbon associated with that performer travel. And I do that for every event, whether it's a cracking game, whether it's a storm game, whether it's a private event, um, whether it's a concert. Um, so again, we know that we're always going to have folks coming to the building, but what can we do about it if we're having to account for that carbon? Well, we have a goal that, uh, that asks or that says that we need to have 25% of all of our fans take public transit to all of our events. Why? Again, public transit emits far fewer greenhouse gas emissions than a single occupancy vehicle. So we know if we have 15,000 fans coming to the building for cracking games and for concerts, that's a large carbon metric for us to hold on to. So what can we do? What can we do to reduce that impact on us, but also give an opportunity for the fans to do the right thing. So if you're coming to a storm game or a cracking game, your ticket into the building also doubles as a free public transportation pass two hours before the event and two hours after the event. Um, we're really conveniently located smack dab downtown where we have bus stops um, block like right in front of our arena as well as blocks um, and in really close range to the arena. We're also a five minute walk to the monorail station. Um, so again, super easy to get to our venue via public transportation, which is why we want to give our fans um, as much access as we can. Um, so I mentioned carbon. So during the process of our naming rights agreement, AWS, Amazon Web Services, built us a carbon dashboard. Um, it covers all scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And you'll kind of see on the left-hand side right here, some of the KPIs I'm already tracking. So electricity, landfill, merchandise. Merchandise is a fun one. Um, so for Post Malone, let's just say, I'll get with our merchandise team and I'll say, hey, how, what was the gross sale for apparel and non-apparel items? Um, and let's just call it 100,000 and 50,000. Um, I'm actually able to go into this carbon dashboard and say, okay, our pre-sale markup was about six times. So I'll divide the gross sales by six to get that pre-markup cost. So I stick that pre-markup cost in our carbon dashboard and there's a carbon um, emissions factor associated with the sale of merchandise. So the back end of this thing does its thing and then is able to spit out a carbon metric associated with the merch sales of that Post Malone show. Um, and again, we do this for every single event, whether it's a cracking game, a storm game, or a concert. Um, we also track things like uh, food transport to the building, like I mentioned. So we work with Delaware North, who's our food provider, on getting that data. And we also work with WM, who's our waste hauler, on getting um, all of our hauling information. 
Um, so that's kind of just a glimpse into our dashboard. Um, that's kind of a wrap from me. I know that was a, a lot, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, if anybody has any. I'm sorry, I just have a quick question and, and I apologize, someone was asking me a question right when you said it, but the, what is the items that you work with Delaware North on? Um, what was the information that you received from them? Yeah, so Delaware North obviously orders our food and beverages. And so uh, the data that we need from them is, okay, what items are you procuring that are within our 300 mile radius? And what items are you procuring that aren't um, within that 300 mile radius? So we have a really easy system. We say, put a one next to the items that are included in that 300 mile radius, and then put a zero in front of the items that aren't included in that 300 mile radius. And um, they're actually able to automatically upload that data set and we've we've formatted it all for them. It's super easy for them to use um, into a remote, a remote API where they literally just drop the file in and it's ingested straight into our carbon dashboard. Oh, that's very cool. We use, we, our partners are Delaware North as well. So I was just Oh, curious. really good. Yeah, to see, you know, if, if that's something we wanted to do, obviously it can be done. So. Yep. Yep. It, it was a tough one just because especially for a while as we opened the building, um, there was a lot of supply chain issues. So sure. there for a while, our numbers kind of slipped. But we were able to kind of make up for that by just getting creative and, and trying to find more local solutions with Delaware North. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. There's more questions. I think we're all flabbergasted. <laughs> it's a mouthful, that's for sure. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I agree. Was, that was amazing. Yeah, that's <laughs> pretty impressive. I agree. So I'm sure we'll have questions down the road, but that was that's just amazing. And you know, I it's just amazing when people say you can't do stuff and then somebody goes out and does it. You know, we have a net zero building in Detroit. That, um IBEW International Brotherhood Electrical Workers and a lot of people thought that couldn't be done and it's like nope it a is a lot of people I, I will say a lot of people thought we were not going to meet that zero waste goal I mean for an arena the average diversion rate for an arena in the U.S. is around 44 to 50 percent and a lot of people said y'all are never going to hit 95 and then we hit 98. So it can be done and there was a lot of failure. That's what we don't always talk about, but there was a lot of fails. I had a lot of bad ideas, but we also had a lot of good ideas and it, it was just a matter of really trialing and erroring. And um, we wouldn't have been able to do it without our housekeeping team. We utilize Pritchard. Um, State Farm Arena also uses Pritchard. I was their zero waste consultant and um, they were actually able to achieve the first ever zero waste certification for an arena um, just last year. So it can definitely be done. It, it just was not easy getting there. But like I say to every venue, if y'all need any support on the waste front, I'm happy to share all of our waste operations. We have a zero waste manual that kind of goes through the steps on how we are where we are. Um, so I can save everybody else time because I know that we spent a ton of time trying to figure that out. That's, That's incredible. What's great about the best practice group is we can save each other time. <laughs> totally. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe um, you know, it'd be interesting to see if you guys, you know, research the reuse a little bit and decide if that's something that would help you get to the hundred percent clear landfill. Oh, I don't know. It's just an interesting, it's a whole new way of doing things. And so it, it'll be interesting to see if it takes off, hopefully. Reuse is definitely the next wave. I mean, right. especially here in Seattle, we've got Reuse Seattle that teams up with R Cup. I'm sure Kelly and John, y'all have heard of R Cup, Bold Reuse out of Austin. I mean, Moody Center down in Austin is already trialing Turn, which is another reusable cup program. So, I mean, arenas are dabbling. I think it's just a matter of that one, that one arena just really pushing it out. Mm -hmm really interesting when you think too about the manufacturing of the product and the um you know carbon reduction from not even making it making that making composting ones 
So I'm sure Kelly and you guys could go into that whole scenario too. That's another good thing about that, right? Mm -hmm. Somebody's not making all those cups mm -hmm. and that, that in itself is not good. Hmm. Awesome. B, B, is your manual, can, is that a PDF that you could send me? I'd like to look through that. So when I'm talking to other arenas, I can possibly give them some information if something comes about, you know, very on very basic, but, you know, just so I have yeah. some extra knowledge. Yeah, I'd be happy to send that to you. Thank you. If you want to send it to me, I can forward it out to everybody if you want, if that would be Great. easier. Yep. Um, along with the link to this recording so people can share it. Um, but we really appreciate you sharing um, all of your information with us. It's very exciting. I wish I could come see it. I hope someday to come see it. Oh, please I was, come I was, about, I was about to say, that's my final question. Is when can I come <laughs> look at all this stuff? <laughs> we, get a bus, you know, we get a bus from Detroit. Um, <laughs> I think the rainwater is so fascinating. That, that's amazing. Right, it's one of my favorite parts of the building besides yeah. the living wall. I think the only stat about the living wall I didn't share was that it's the most it's Instagram, Instagram spot Instagram. in the building. And that yeah. literally there's like a half a mile line <laughs> at every event with people taking photos in front of the living wall. I mean, it's cool, but every time I walk by, I'm like, wow, the living wall really gets people riled up here in Seattle. So think of the funny. impact of every person that comes into that building. And then they start to think about what they're doing in their personal lives. Totally. It's just amazing. It's just amazing. That is so awesome. Any other questions, anybody? Jamie, are you? I don't know what Jamie this is. that our Jamie? Are you there? <laughs> Fred, is that our Jamie? No. no oh, it's not. okay. I just, I didn't know. Jamie, do you want to say hello? I didn't know if maybe she had a different last name on there. No? Okay. All right. We will figure out who it is at some point. <laughs> yeah, I, I got to run. I have another meeting. So nice seeing everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We're all wrapped up here anyway. So, all right. All right. right. Well, thank you guys. Thanks, it was Steve. Wonderful. That was amazing. Thank you, for thank you Connie. B, that yeah. was great. Thank I'll look you so much. I'll all be right. out in December, B. <laughs> awesome. Bye. -bye. Right. Bye. Glad you got a connection. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. See ya.